in this section, well, basically we're going to tackle the same problem as before in the structural change test, but we'll do it in a in a slightly different way, okay? A slightly different angle here. But we are starting out with the same model, and we use our same example here. So what we now want to do is we want to allow for a break. We basically want to adjust the model to allow for a break and to adjust it, we need what's called a dummy variable. Now, a dummy variable is a, val is a variable that, that takes value 0 or 1. Now, in our case, we're going to say dt. We're going to call that dummy variable dt. And it is going to take a value of 0 for all observations t, for which t, our year, is smaller or equal to 1981 and it's going to take a value of 1 for t larger than 1981. Now think about dt as a vector, okay, because savings and disposable is a vector. Basically dt is a vector and it starts out with zeros and at some point it will change into ones. If you think about the years, the years which we have here, the last zero year, that's going to be 1981, and the first one year is going to be 1982. So this is what our dummy variable looks like. If you if you were to graph it in a little plot, it would look if there's zero, zero here, and then it will take a value of one here, and time is here, and here's dt. This is why this is also called a step dummy. Okay, this particular type of dummy variable is called a step dummy. I'll talk later about very briefly different types of dummy variables. Of course, creating the dummy variable is only one thing. What we really need to do is we then need to adjust our model. Okay, and here's our adjust model. We have basically added two variables to the old one. Let me just underline what we had before. We had a constant and disposable income. We have a constant here and disposable income here. But now we have two additional dummy variables. One, we just include our dummy variables trait in here. Okay, that's what we have. That's what we have here. Okay, just the dummy variables trait. But then we also have our disposable income times the dummy variable. It's perhaps easier to see the general point if you think about this guy here as the constant which is just a vector of ones times the dummy variable and then here what it is anyway the disposable income times a dummy variable. And now you can see that really what we've done is we've taken, because here we in a way have a constant as well, okay, you can think of here as a vector of 1, we have taken both of our original explanatory variables, the constant and disposable income, and we multiplied them with the dummy variable and then included these new terms in our regression. So if we had initially two terms, the constant and disposable income, we will now have four terms, two additional terms. If these two guys, beta 2 and alpha 2, if they are zero, then there is no structural break because then our model just collapses back to 166. Okay, 166 is equal to 168 and there is no structural break. So that means that, uh, oh, that sentence is in incomplete, but this model 166 is correct. What, however, if H0 is rejected, or what is the uh, alternative we have in mind here? So the alternative which we get if H0 is rejected is the following. So if 
H0 is rejected. Oh, by the way, how would you test this hypothesis? An F test. Okay, I'll get back to this. Let's just think of HA. Okay, so we are thinking of the alternative hypothesis here. So if alpha 2 and beta 2 are not equal to 0, then we can basically differentiate between two, two cases. Let's firstly think of all observations up to and including 1981. As we've discussed before, in that case the dummy variable will take the value 0. So that means, of course, if the dummy variable takes the value of 0, that means that this term, dt, alpha 2 times dt will be equal to 0, and disposable income times dt times beta 2 will be equal to 0. That means all we are left with is alpha 1 plus beta 1 disposable income, this guy here, alpha 1 plus beta 1 disposable income plus the error term. Thinking about the second part of the sample, t larger than 1981, this is the case where our dummy variable takes the value 1. Now again, 0 was special, but 1 is special in a way as well, because then what we have here is alpha 1 plus alpha 2 times 1. So we have basically a new constant, alpha 1 plus beta 2. And then what have we got here? We have beta 1 times disposable income plus beta 2 times disposable income times 1. So we have beta 1 times disposable income plus beta 2 times disposable income, and that can be sort of summarized in this term, beta 1 plus beta 2 times disposable income. And now we see how these dummy variables are very useful because we can see that these coefficients, alpha 2 and beta 2, they tell us the difference between the, in the firstly, this guy, alpha 2, is basically the difference in the constant between the two subsamples. And beta 2 is the difference in slope. between the two subsamples. Okay. And now we can we can see how we could test more specific hypotheses. Firstly we should we should say that if you test H naught that alpha two is equal to beta two equals to naught with the alternative that alpha 2 and or beta 2 is unequal to 0. If you do that, you're basically testing for a structural break, exactly the same as what we did with a child test. How do you do that? Use an F test. And if you do that, this will be exactly the same as the child test. Okay, you get numerically the same result. If, however, you're testing H0 that alpha 2 is equal to 0 and HA that alpha 2 is unequal to 0, you're testing for a change in the constant only. Ancient constant only and how would you test this you would use a t-test okay you estimate your model 168 and you perform a t-test on alpha 2 because it's a one restriction test only and of course you could test beta 2 equal to naught 
if the alternative at beta 2 is unequal to 0 and then you are testing for a change in slope and again in slope only and again you would use a t-test. So now in this framework of 168 you can actually exactly test whether it's the constant and or the slope that causes the structural change. Now a few more issues we got to uh, talk about with respect to dummy variables. Section 831. So as I already mentioned, the dummy variable in cross-sectional data can differentiate between two or more groups. Okay, then we could for instance have a DI if you have cross-sectional data if you differentiate between genders, which takes a value 1, if we have a female observation, and zero if male, for instance. And but otherwise the same mechanics apply. Secondly, you have to be aware of creating a perfect multicollinearity problem by including too many dummy variables. What do I mean with this? That's use the following example. So imagine we have our same dummy variable which we had before. So that was previously our dt, okay? but we now call it d1t. And let's also include d2t, a variable which basically switches this around. Okay, This is zero for t larger than 81 and 1 for t smaller or equal up to 81. And let's assume we have a constant. Now could you now have a model where you model some variable yt, perhaps the uh, savings again as above, and have a model like this. Let me just say gamma naught times a constant. Usually we leave that away. Okay, plus gamma 1 times d1t plus gamma 2 times d2t and then plus some explanatory variables and perhaps those again uh, multiplied with the dummy variables. If you do that, so what we had in our previous model we had this guy included and this guy but not this guy. So if you include all of them what you have to realize is that these three terms Okay, the constant t1 and t2t, there's a t missing, this one. These guys are perfectly related to each other because d2t is nothing else but 1 minus the dummy variable for 1. Okay, remember d2t will have uh, ones at the beginning, 1, 1, 1, and then zeros, just more observations, that's just stylized. That's the same as a, const, a vector of 1s minus d1t, which starts out with zeros and then has 1s. So if you include all three of them, these three will be perfectly correlated with each other. That's a case of perfect multicollinearity. And Evis won't even estimate your model. Next, and that only very briefly, really, I said earlier that uh, what we dealt with was what was called a step dummy and that there are different type of dummies. And dummies they can take all sorts of forms and usually we adapt them to the problem. So basically what I want to say is dummy variables can take sometimes if you look at time series at the time series plot for them they can take forms like this, 0, 0, up to a certain value, then perhaps 1 for only one observation, and then 0, or depending on the problem, so that was a 1 here, they could be 1, 0, negative 1, they could be, like the, uh, sorry, that was not right, they could be 0, negative 1, plus one and then zero again. Okay? These type of dummies 
that are zero at the beginning and the end, we often call them impulse dummies. And we use them for sort of different types of problems. For instance, in Australia, when there was VAT introduced in July 2000, and that meant uh, it actually meant that cars would became cheaper because some other tax was reduced on cars, and that meant. Uh, People knew that from July onwards cars would be cheaper, so in June they didn't buy as many. But in July they bought more and then it leveled out and then we used that sort of impulse dummy. Sometimes, depending on the problem, you need this type of dummy to capture a special effect. So this is basically to deal these types of dummies we usually use to deal with outliers. Okay, when there are some sort of special effects on some observations. And uh, the last few points I want to make with respect to dummy variables. Here they come. Firstly, you should really try and keep the number of dummy variables you use as small as possible. Especially if you have outliers, there may be the temptation to put a dummy variable for all outliers because you don't, don't like certain data. It's really, you really have to be careful. And um, in, in fact, it relates a little bit to, uh, to the third point here. These two points are in a way related. And if you have a lot of dummy variables, the interpretation of the coefficients to the dummy variables is actually quite difficult. We saw earlier how we interpreted beta 2 and alpha 2, okay, that was here. There were the differences in the slope and the constant between the two subsamples. If you have a lot of dummy variables, this interpretation becomes very difficult and you have to think carefully about it in every example. If you were to reject a null hypothesis here, remember in the Chow test we uh, assumed constant residual variance or homoscedasticity. If you have actually change in residual variance, you could think about, oh, okay, can I include a dummy variable for that? It turns out that is a very clever idea if you have it, but it's not as straightforward because including dummy variables for, for changes in variance cannot be done in an OLS framework unless you use GLS, that's sort of one way of doing it. Uh, what we usually need is we need a maximum likelihood framework. And I'll introduce maximum likelihood, ML stands for maximum likelihood, and you'll get, actually get a very short introduction of that at the end of this course. And lastly, often it is actually the dependent variable that is in the form of a dummy variable. Now this is very in, this is very interesting. This is sort of cases where we want to explain whether, for instance, you buy or not buy a product, and then we can that decision buying or not buying can be represented in a dummy variable. Okay, the i could be one if you buy and zero if you don't buy. Okay, or do you use public transport or not if you go to work? Same sort of thing. And it's a really interesting area of econometrics, but you need a very different set, set of different models for this. You're then basically modeling probabilities of buying or probabilities of using public transport. And again, what we really need is a very different framework. And uh, we need to, to estimate these models then with maximum likelihood again. All right, this is really all I had to say. Just underneath an hour, that's okay. Thank you very much.